hello friends, thank you for joining our study. Uh, I just want to say thank you to the Baha'i administration. Uh, please know that this is actually a personal interpretation. It is my opinion and my understanding of the Baha'i writings. Uh, for an official view, please actually refer to the Baha'i writings themselves and jump over to Baha'i.org. Uh, in the description below, you're going to find an MP3 version of this talk, uh, a PDF with all the quotes that are actually being used, and as well, timestamps of the different sections of the talk, so you can always jump ahead or get back to where you were before. And if for any reason you would like to be alerted of upcoming videos, uh, please click subscribe. Today we're going to be talking about how the Quran uh, speaks of actually the New Testament, the Christian uh, Bible, and the Old Testament, or the Jewish Torah. Um, this topic is very relevant because we're dealing with building bridges between faiths. And any time we're having dialogue, for example, with a Muslim, this will relate to Islam's relationship to Judaism and Christianity. But as well, when we begin to look at the relationship between Islam and Christianity, or Islam and Judaism itself, this is going to become very relevant. Uh, the reason why I chose this is because often, within the Islamic world, we will hear people claim that, for example, that the New Testament or the Old Testament are not authentic or that these scriptures have somehow been perverted or corrupted over time. And this definitely relates to how the Islamic world has to address problems that appear uh, to exist between the New Testament and the Quran, or between the Jewish scriptures and the Quran itself. Uh, oftentimes I think, say, individual Muslims, it's, for example, will look at the Old Testament or at the New Testament and see something that doesn't seem to jive. Uh, with their understandings, and therefore will claim that this scripture itself is not authentic, uh, as a means to, if you will, circumnavigate the problems. Um, the question here is whether or not uh, the Quran itself actually uh, calls into question, if you will, the authenticity of the New Testament and the Old Testament, and what the Baha'i Faith itself states regarding this relationship between the authenticity. This idea that the original scripture somehow became heavily corrupted uh, often appears in rather peculiar <laughs> ways at times within the Islamic community where you have individual state that uh, prior uh, to Islam, um, the actual Jews and Christians actually followed Quranic law itself. Uh, and that we can see sort of, if you will, echoes within the New Testament or echoes within the Old Testament that the laws adhered to within the Qur'an are what Christians and Jews originally followed, but that this slow corruption and, if you will, dissolution of the original scriptures or teachings of the prophets has watered them down so far that we can no longer really truly see them. That's why we needed the Qur'an, in order to have it, if you will, uh, vindicated and updated so that we can see the truth of the original revelation of Moses and Jesus. The idea, actually, that the scriptures of a prior dispensation, for example, uh, Judaism being a dispensation prior to Christianity, or Christianity being prior to Islam in this case, um, is completely lost. That the teachings of it and the guidance that it offered originally are completely lost is untenable uh, according to the Baha'i scriptures. Uh, we here start with a quote from Baha'u'llah relating directly to the question of whether or not the New Testament and the Old Testament were actually authoritative guides, if you will, for humanity up until the advent of the Prophet Muhammad. And should they reply, The books that are in the hands of this people, which they call the Gospel, and attribute to Jesus the son of Mary, have not been revealed by God, and proceed not from the manifestations of his self. Then this would imply a cessation in the abounding grace of him who is the source of all grace. If so, God's testimony to his servants would have remained incomplete, and his favor proven imperfect. His mercy would not have shone resplendent, nor would his grace have overshadowed all. For if at the ascension of Jesus his book had likewise ascended unto heaven, then how could God reprove and chastise the people on the day of resurrection? as hath been written by the Imams of the Faith, and affirmed by its illustrious divines." 
So Baha'u'llah here is questioning if actually the original teachings of Jesus Christ had actually ascended with him, right? If we had actually lost his original teachings, how is it that anybody could be held account for their rejection or denial of the Prophet Muhammad himself? So that the very truth and justice of God is called into question if we claim that there was not enough evidence and not enough guidance from the Christian scriptures for them to actually have been able to accept Islam. In addition to the first quote, which was from the Gems of Divine Mysteries by Baha'u'llah, we have another example of the same point coming up in the Book of Certitude. It reads, We have also heard a number of the foolish of the earth assert that the genuine text of the heavenly gospel doth not exist amongst the Christians, that it hath, that it hath ascended unto heaven. How grievously they have erred! How oblivious of the fact that such a statement imputeth the gravest injustice and tyranny to a gracious and loving providence. How could God, when once the day star of the beauty of Jesus had disappeared from the sight of his people, and ascended under the fourth heaven, cause his holy book, his most great testimony, amongst his creatures, to disappear also? What would be left to that people to cling to, from the setting of the day star of Jesus, until the rise of the sun of the Mohammedan dispensation? What law could be their stay and guide? How could such people be made the victims of the avenging wrath of God, the omnipotent avenger? How could they be afflicted with the scourge of chastisement by the heavenly king? Above all, how could the flow of the grace of the all-bountiful be stayed? How could the ocean of his tender mercies be stilled? We take refuge with God from that which his creatures have fancied about him, exalted as he above their comprehension. Mahalo here is saying that it would be a grievous error, once again, to state that actually the message of Jesus Christ was somehow lost after his ascension. Why? Because not only could they not be judged, but what would be their guide? What would be the revelation of God's bounty and grace unto humankind from the setting of the day star of the beauty of Jesus Christ unto the rising of the son of the prophet Muhammad? If in some sense the teachings of Jesus Christ had actually ascended with him, meaning they had disappeared from the face of the earth after his ascension, then what then would even be the point of Jesus' coming in the first place? But rather, his sacrifice upon this earth and his message unto humankind, the glad tidings of the kingdom of God, were there to actually guide people from the Islamic view and from the Baha'i view from his ascension into heaven under the coming of the Prophet Muhammad. So, in a sense, this is a philosophical argument based upon Scripture and the concept of the abounding grace and guidance of God unto humankind. Um, at the same time, the question still remains whether or not the Quran itself has anything to say on the matter. So we're going to begin in the second surah, or the second chapter of the Quran. This is the book. In it is guidance, sure, without doubt, to those who fear Allah, who believe in the unseen, are steadfast in prayer, and spend out of what we have provided for them, and who believe in the revelation sent to thee and sent before thy time, and in their hearts have the assurance of the hereafter. A second quote from chapter 35, verse 31. That which we have revealed to thee of the book is the truth, confirming what was revealed before it. For Allah is assuredly, with respect to his servants, well acquainted and fully observant. So assuredly in here, in these two quotes, the Quran is definitely confirming the prior revelations. We also hear this in uh, Surah 2, verses 53 to 56. A further quote. From the second chapter of the Quran. And remember we gave Moses the scripture and the criterion between right and wrong. There was a chance for you to be guided aright. So the Quran unequivocally confirms revelations sent unto humankind before. Um, a Muslim can believe in the revelation sent before thy time, that which came prior. 
Now the question still remains though, is it possible, and it would be a justifiable objection, that the Quran itself is vindicating and confirming, say, the prophethood of Moses, or the prophethood of Abraham, or that Jesus Christ himself was the Spirit sent from God unto humankind, but at the same time not confirming the Scriptures? Yes, that's very possible. So we'll, we'll read on. This is again from the second chapter of the Quran. O children of Israel, call to mind the special favor which I bestowed upon you, and fulfill your covenant with me, as I fill, fulfill my covenant with you, and fear none but me. And believe in what I reveal, confirming the revelation which is with you, and be not the first to reject faith therein, nor sell my signs for a small price, and fear me and me alone, and cover not truth with falsehood, nor conceal the truth when you know what it is." In this passage of the Qur'an, there's a very particular phrase that is used, because it says, Believe in what I reveal, God says, confirming the revelation which is with you. For those who read Arabic, ma'akum. It's actually with the people that it's addressing. What do the Jews have with them? <laughs> Their scriptures. The scriptures of Judaism and Christianity are extant, meaning they are in current existence in a form that can be read by people. So when the Quran says, or God says in the Quran, that it is, again, confirming the revelation which is with you, right after it says, and believe what I reveal, and confirming the revelation which is with you. So there is one revelation confirming another revelation that they actually currently have. We will move on. We actually have the Quran later uh, censure some Jews who only believe in part of their book. This is from, again, the second chapter of the Quran. After this it is ye the same people who slay among yourselves, and banish a party of you from their homes, assist their enemies against them in guilt and rancor. And if they come to you as captives, ye ransom them, that it was not lawful for you to banish them. Then is it only a part of the book that ye believe in? And do ye reject the rest? But what is the reward for those among you who behave like this, but disgrace in this life, and on the day of judgment they shall be consigned to the most grievous penalty, for Allah is not unmindful of what ye do. We gave the Moses the book, and followed him up with a succession of apostles. We gave Jesus the son of Mary clear signs, and strengthened him with the Holy Spirit. Is it that whenever there comes to you an apostle, with what ye yourselves desire not, ye are puffed up with pride. Some ye called impostors, and others ye slay. And when there comes to them a book from Allah confirming what is with them, although from old they had prayed for victory against those without faith, when there comes to them that which they should have recognized, they refuse to believe in it, but the curse of Allah is on those without faith. So in this case, again, we actually have God communicating through the Prophet Muhammad in the Quran, censuring the Jewish people for dealing unjustly with people, and selecting one part of the book that they claim to be from God, and not actually abiding by the laws within the rest of it. So they're being picking and choosing, if you will, from their own scriptures. And this is actually blameworthy in the sight of God, according to the Quran. Once again we see in verse 89, in this passage, and when there comes to them a book from God, confirming what is with them. So one book confirming another thing that they have with them. That which they are only taking a part of and listening to. So basically, in essence, God gave Moses a book. The Quran verifies what they actually possess, and the Jewish community is admonished for only believing in a part of it. There is a problem that would arise if we were to claim that the Quran is not actually vindicating these scriptures. 
The problem is it would cause horrible confusion. Because in this case, it's saying it's confirming what is with them. It is admonishing them for not actually adhering to what is in it, right? Which would mean that it's actually confirming a corrupt text, something that could not have guided them. So in this sense, we see that the Quran, I believe, is very, very clear. It's stating that the scriptures, in this case, what the Jewish people have with them at this time, is actually the guide that God had sent unto humankind. Now another passage from uh, Surah 3. It is he who sent down to thee, step by step in truth, the book, confirming what went before it. And he sent down the law and the gospel of Jesus before this, as a guide to mankind. And he sent down the criterion of judgment between right and wrong. Surah 28. We did reveal to Moses the book after we had destroyed the earlier generations to give insight to men and guidance and mercy that they might receive admonition. So in this first passage, the Quran actually mirrors, if you will, the Quran, the Gospel, and the Torah. It's talking about God's revelation unto humankind and actually uses the terms the Torah and the Injil, or the Gospel itself. It's then, when we actually see this, we actually have to consider the historical context because these are actually terms that are being used for actually collections of Scripture. The New Testament, the Gospel, the Torah itself. So when we actually see this, it would be again an issue of grave confusion. If the Quran itself was actually saying it confirmed what was revealed before, referring to it by terms that are generally used, and these actual collections are extant at this time. Yes, of course, there might be some questions about, for example, the fluidity uh, of the canon itself. But remember that for the most part, when we're actually within the, in this case, the 7th century, we actually have really a pretty, pretty solid collection of scriptures that we would refer to as the Gospel or the Torah. Next, from chapter 46 of the Quran. And before this was the book of Moses as a guide and mercy. And this book confirms it in the Arabic tongue. To admonish the unjust and as glad tidings to those who do right. In this passage, it's important to notice that this book confirms the book of Moses. And it itself is not, for example, uh, Islam confirming um, Judaism. It is actually this book confirming that which is actually revealed previously, the book of Moses, the Torah itself. Chapter 4 from the Quran, verse 136. O ye who believe, believe in Allah and his messenger, and the scripture which he hath sent to his messenger, and the scripture which he sent to those before him. Any who denieth Allah, his angels, his books, his messenger, in the day of judgment hath gone far, far astray. Here in Surah 4, verse 136 of the Quran, it's again, in my opinion, just very, very straightforward. God is saying, believe in God, his messenger, the scripture which he gave to his messenger, and the scripture which he sent before him. And it actually, in the Arabic, uses the word kitab, meaning book. So we're not talking about the messenger. It actually says the messenger and the book. So it's very clear that we're discussing a physical object, a revelation. And then at the end, wherein it says, any who denieth God, his angels, his books, his messenger, hath gone far astray. Once again, this term in the Arabic is kutub. It is the books. So we are actually discussing, in this case, revelations from God that are collected in scrolls, in books, that we can actually turn to. And once again, we have a challenge here because at this point in time, we have those books. So for the Quran to be stating that it confirms the books that are with them, but they're not the actual books that are with them, would be outright 
ridiculous. Obviously, the Quran is actually talking about something that these people know. The listeners of the Quran itself are aware of what it's referring to. The books that are with them, the books of Moses and the New Testament. This is the, the fundamental problem is, is that we're dealing with an issue where actually the New Testament canon within the 7th century is really a canon. No, of course, you haven't had the Reformation, which comes up later, which deals with some of actually, say, the, what we call the Apocrypha, but you actually have a collection of texts that are being referred to that is being confirmed. And it makes no distinction, in this case, of some you have to shave off and some you have to, you know what I mean? And if, if this actually was something important, why is actually the Quran not actually coming out and saying it? Why is it not clarifying? If I say I'm a Muslim and I actually believe the Quran is the revelation of God unto humankind to guide a right, and it's actually saying, well, these books that are extant at the time of actually the proclamation of God through the Prophet Muhammad to the Islamic community, if these books it's actually confirming, am I then to actually begin going in and sorting amongst them? Because often you'll have, for example, statements made that the letters of the Apostle Paul are not being uh, vindicated or verified or confirmed by the Quran itself. But at this point in time, when we're actually talking about the Injil, it is actually a collection of texts that is generally solid by the 7th century. It is actually being printed in scrolls and in bindings. So what is the Quran saying? Well, I take it at face value. The Quran is actually stating we confirm what is in their hands. A phrase that actually is used in the Arabic, that which is between their hands. An additional point here is to note that at the end of this passage, in Surah 4, at 136, it actually says, Any who denieth Allah, God, his angels, his books, his messengers, and the day of judgment hath gone far, far astray. They are no longer on the straight path, those who would actually deny his books. And he's been very clear that the scriptures that have been revealed before. But you have a situation where many will actually deny <laughs> his books. It, it really is truly a tragedy that has caused much confusion and deepened the rifts between the communities and created greater misunderstandings that actually these kinds of passages are not seen as clearly as they actually are. To see that actually the Quran itself is confirming and validating the scriptures previously people seeing overt or surface level, uh, if you will, inconsistencies between the New Testament and the Quran, then assume that they actually have to choose. They have to choose either to accept the Quran and therefore the New Testament or the Old Testament is corrupt, or they have to actually remain with the actual New Testament or the Old Testament and actually assume that the Quran is false. But this is actually a false dichotomy because we can actually solve the problems that exist between them, as odd as that may sound to some individuals. Uh, this is actually the, the, the process of actually solving apparent contradictions, which is the work that we're trying to do on this, this video series. Because yes, you might actually have, for example, Muslims who believe that the Quran states that Jesus Christ was never crucified. Uh, the swoon theory, that he was taken down from the cross, because from their perspective, they actually see it as saying that uh, the Jews did not crucify him. No, it was only a likeness of him. And this will be grabbed on by the Christian community to claim that this is actually a falsification. You either have to choose the New Testament story or you have to choose the Quranic story. Um, yet actually this, as we will see in shortly, um, in a subsequent video is, is actually something that is quite easily solved <laughs> and we can actually also should acknowledge the fact that actually there are Muslims who when they hear this idea that Jesus Christ was never crucified find it completely bizarre that any Muslims believe this. How do I know this? Because I lived in the Middle East and talked with Muslims who believe that this was a bizarre notion that Jesus Christ was never crucified. Why? Because they themselves knew passages like this in the Quran, which told them that that, act, that scripture was actually authentic. 
It even gives us insight into why the Qur'an itself does not go deeply and deeply and deeply, for example, into the story of Jesus Christ. Many Christians in this day actually know that the Qur'an itself speaks directly of Jesus Christ, talks about his life, references Moses, references Abraham. At the same time, uh, when talking with Christian friends, um, what will be brought up is, but it does not dwell, if you will, and I don't mean this in a negative sense, it doesn't dwell on the life of Jesus Christ, on the nature of his actual suffering on the cross. But I was just the answer is simple. It's assuming you have the New Testament. It's actually confirmed the New Testament and told you that that which is between their hands, that which was revealed beforehand, is Scripture. You're supposed to know that story and have it. Just like, for example, the New Testament does not constantly and consistently go over the story of Moses, or consistently go over the stories of Joshua, or the stories of Elijah, or the story of Joseph for that matter. Why? Because you actually have the Hebrew Scriptures. They are there for you to read and learn about. That's their purpose. I propose that's the identical issue with the Quran itself. It is actually expecting you as a revelation from God, confirming these prior scriptures to get to know them, to fall in love with them, and to realize that they're the foundations of your faith as a Muslim. So this next passage is from uh, the fifth surah of the Quran. But why do they come to thee for a decision? When they have their own law before them. Therein is the command of Allah, and even after that they would turn away, for they are not really people of faith. It was we who revealed the law to Moses. Therein was guidance and light. By its standard have been judged the Jews by the prophets who bowed to Allah's will, by the rabbis and the doctors of law. For to them was entrusted the protection of Allah's book, and they were witnesses thereto. Therefore fear not men, but fear me, and sell not my signs for a miserable price. If any do fail to judge by the light of what Allah hath revealed, they are no better than unbelievers. What is happening in this passage? The Jews are being admonished for not judging by what God hath revealed. It's stated that they have their law before them. And the term used in the Arabic is Torah, the Torah. So it states that they have their own law, their Torah, and they err when they fail to judge by that which God hath believed. That actually this book was given to them whereby they are to judge amongst men, and that their rabbis, their doctors of law, and the prophets themselves have been charged with protecting it as a guidance, and by that which should be used to judge the people. The surah then repeats the same argument for the Christians and the Gospels. So this is again, surah 5, this is 46 to 47. And in their footsteps, we send Jesus, the son of Mary, confirming the law, Torah, that had come before him. We sent him the gospel. Therein was guidance and light and confirmation of the law that had come before him, a guidance and an admonition to those who fear Allah. Let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah hath revealed therein. If any do fail to judge by the light of what Allah hath revealed, they are no better than those who rebel. In 548, to thee we send the scripture in truth, confirming the scripture that came before it, and guarding it in safety. So judge between them by what Allah hath revealed, and follow not their vain desires, diverging from the truth that hath come to thee. To each among you we have prescribed a law and an open way. If Allah had so willed, he would have made you a single people. But his plan is to test you, and what he hath given you, so strive as in a race in all virtues. The goal of you all is to Allah. It is he that will show you the truth of the matters of which you dispute. 
So first we have this passage regarding the Jews and the Torah. We then have Jesus Christ confirm that law, Torah in Arabic, and God sent him the gospel. A guidance and light, and that Christians must, quote, judge by what Allah hath revealed therein. So the Christians are being charged with judging their community with the law that is revealed in the New Testament. The Jews themselves are being charged with judging their own people according to the law of Moses. And that in the New Testament, the gospel, that it actually confirmed the law that was sent before. The final verse is, To thee we sent the scriptures. So we then have that Muhammad and the Muslims must judge by what God hath revealed. To each group, it says, was prescribed a law. Each faith group, Jews, Christians, and Muslims, must abide by their respective scriptures according to their own law. It then says, the scripture, the Quran, confirms the scripture that came before it, in verse 548. The Christians must judge and are to be judged by the gospel, a scripture confirmed by the Quran. So in this case, and this actually is very important to consider with a relationship to the status of non-Muslims under Islamic rule, an issue we hope to address in the future, is that they are being charged here in this passage of the Quran with being judged according to their own law. That the Jews can be judged by Jewish law. The Christians can be judged by Christian law. And the Muslims themselves have to judge by their own law. So the idea of actually taking the, the Islamic law and actually applying it to the Muslim, or sorry, to the Christians or the Jews themselves seems to contradict explicitly this passage in the Quran. But here we see that just as we have scripture that was confirmed, judged by the scripture, Christians. Scripture, the Christian scripture confirmed the Old Testament, but the Christians were given the gospel and they have to be judged by it. The Quran was revealed, it confirmed what came before it, and that the Muslims are to be judged by that scripture. I think what the Quran is saying here is, is that you have, a, you have a community here who has a scripture that was given to them by God. That community, if they have not accepted the Quran, if they have not accepted the Prophet Muhammad, they are to be judged by their own law, because they do not accept the law of Islam as divinely revealed. But you as Muslims actually believe that this group has a revelation from God. And I am telling you, this is the voice of God, very clearly that this is actually from me. It was a guide and a light unto humankind. So judge them by it. Let them rule themselves by their own law. Then came along Jesus, son of Mary, and he brought actually a revelation from God unto humankind. And the Quran here is saying, and we are confirming it. And this scripture itself is from God, and they themselves do not accept Islam, therefore they are to be judged by their own scripture, which is from God. The Quran comes along and says, and unto thee we revealed this scripture, and you are to abide by it. But what is that that you're supposed to be abiding by it? These two former statements. And in order to be someone who abides by the law of the Quran, the Christians are to be judged by their own law, and the Jews are to be judged by their own law. I think the Quran makes its position very clear. It states that the Jews have a revelation with them that it confirms. In chapter 2, verses 40 to 42, chapter 2, verse 89. It censures those who would believe only a part of the book, in this case the Jewish people, in again, Surah 2, verse 85. It validates the Torah and the Gospel, works that are extant, when the Quran is being revealed. It does this in Surah 3, verse 3. It endorses the Book of Moses in 46.12. It commands Muslims to believe in the Scriptures, quote, the Scriptures which he sent to those before. As well, says anyone who denies his books, kutub, plural, hath gone far astray. In Surah 436. It states in 543 to 48, which we just reviewed, that the Jews must judge and be judged by the Torah, that the Christians by the Gospel, and the Muslims by the Quran. 
Now there are, which it is important to note, uh, certain passages within the Quran that are often brought up and put forward as examples for why Muslims believe this. We're going to read a couple of them. One of them is um, chapter 3, verse 78. There is among them a section who distort the book with their tongues. As they read, you would think it is a part of the book, but it is no part of the book. And they say, that is from Allah, but it is not. It is they who tell a lie against Allah, and they well know it. This passage, as with many of them, can easily be understood as individuals who take scripture and actually distort its meaning. And at certain times, even know that they are doing so. Or they will claim that the scriptures say X, but in actual fact this is a doctrine, or this is a belief that they have about the revelation, as opposed to the scripture itself. Another passage, in chapter 5, verses 14 to 15. From those two who call themselves Christians, we did take a covenant, but they forgot a good part of the message that was sent to them, so we estranged them, with enmity and hatred between one another, to the day of judgment. And soon will Allah show them what it is they have done. O people of the book, there hath come to you our messenger, revealing to you much that ye used to hide in the book, and passing over much that is now unnecessary. There hath come to you from Allah a new light and a perspicuous book. I have seen this referred to as well, but this is not a passage claiming that the New Testament itself is corrupt in any way. It's saying, which I believe, that many doctrines and practices and concepts have been accrued or brought in to be, if you will, orthodox positions regarding Christianity that have actually covered over the original intent of the message. And nowhere here do I see it actually being claimed that the scripture itself has been corrupted. Really, basically, the issue here is one of interpretation, interpolation, and the actual bringing forward of creeds and concepts that are orthodox and essential for the believers to be considered as part of the true church. Um, we can see this actually happening because you actually had communities within Christianity, such as the Monophysites, such as the Nestorian Christians, who themselves pretty much were ousted from the European continent because their beliefs were actually deemed heretical and therefore unlawful. I think it's important to note that what the, I believe, again, the Quran is actually stating is, is that we actually have to go back to the scriptures themselves. Just as Baha'is believe, we actually have to look at the Quran, not at Islamic doctrine. We have to look at the New Testament and the Old Testament, not at rabbinical or Christian doctrine itself. There is one passage... Um, there's more than one like it in the Quran, but here it says, Then woe to those who write the book with their own hands, and then say, This is from Allah. To traffic with it for a miserable price. Woe to them for what their hands do write, and for the gain they make thereby. This is one passage which it really does actually sound as if we've got the fabrication of Scripture. And I do think, for many, they hear this and they see, well, I'll see there. There we have the issue where actually this is actually complete fabrication. Um, but I think this, again, has to be seen in light of everything else we've seen. What is this talking about? I would suggest it's talking about things that we all really generally know now, within actual the study of religion. Do we have Gospels that were fabricated? Do the Christ, does the Christian community itself believe that there are Gospels that were fabricated and put forward as Scripture but were not? I think anyone who begins to actually study the case of extant Gospels that are not in the New Testament would have to agree. Do we seem to have fabrications of writings, for example, within the Dead Sea Scrolls, or outside of that, that are Gnostic uh, materials that are claimed to have been from Enoch, or claimed to have been from Abraham, or even have claimed to have been written by Paul himself. And I'm not talking about debate within New Testament studies of what is in the New Testament. I'm talking about pat like scrolls, epistles, 
uh, and books themselves that claim to have been written by a divine author, by a prophetic figure, which we know were not. So I don't think this passage from uh, chapter 2 verse 79 in any way has to be seen as somehow ultimately contradicting everything else that has actually been said by the Quran, but actually chastising those who would fabricate works and put them forward as scripture, which we know happened. When we actually look at this issue, if you will, of dogma, of creeds, of orthodox faith, of, if you will, the accrual of concepts and ideas that, if you will, barnacle the original ship of the revelation of God, uh, people will often state things like um, Christianity teaches, right? Or they'll say Buddhism teaches this, or Islam teaches that. But when you actually really look into it, this is the doctrine of a particular school of Buddhism, a particular school of Christianity, which other Christians would actually debate. So do we have the cases where individuals were writing passages distinctly about, for example, the Prophet Muhammad and attacking Islam and claiming this is from God, meaning this is the truth of what God has said and refutes the actual claim of the Prophet Muhammad? Yes, we do. Here's a passage from Baha'u'llah. And again in another instance he saith, Woe unto those who, with their own hands, transcribe the book corruptly, and then say this is from God, that they may sell it for some mean price. This verse was revealed with reference to the divines and leaders of the Jewish faith. These divines, in order to please the rich, acquire worldly emoluments, and give vent to their envy and misbelief, wrote a number of treatises refuting the claims of Muhammad, supporting their arguments with such evidences that it would be improper to mention, and claimed that these arguments were derived from the Pentateuch. So I think just to wrap this up, um, when we actually look at passages within the Quran itself which speak of corruption of the text, it is corruption through interpretation. It is corruption of the original intent, a perversion of what was actually meant, a misrepresentation, often unintentional, because scripture is being filtered through doctrine, orthodox doctrine, dogmas and creeds. We see that the Quran itself in the end really, really does, I think unequivocally, confirm the scriptures of previous dispensations, in this case, of Judaism and Christianity. So that when the Muslim themselves sees a contradiction or an apparent contradiction from the Quran, and the New Testament itself, between these two works, it cannot be a maneuver, it cannot be to actually claim, well, this is actually just a corruption. This is something that isn't actually revealed by God. Islam itself has to grapple with um, the apparent contradictions that exist between, for example, the New Testament and the Quran, uh, such as, as I've mentioned before, uh, the crucifixion uh, of Jesus Christ, or for example, the Trinity, for that matter. Um, just as the, the Christians themselves have to address some large concerns between the New Testament and the Old Testament, um, and cannot, as per the New Testament itself, claim that the Old Testament is corrupt, a, a Muslim actually stands in the same relationship. And those topics, such as the seeming denial of crucifixion, and also the Trinity, we will address in future topics. Thank you.